We're now two weeks into Ancestor League, and I'm just getting done playing my first character, which is this low-life, white wind, spellblade, ice trap saboteur. It's probably the lowest DPS you'll ever see on a level 99 ice trap build, but the defensive layers have made it super comfy to play. It's been another one of those characters where I don't plan to get to this high of a level, but I don't really die, so it just happens inadvertently. I've been able to comfortably do everything I've needed to do at League's start, including Maven and the Feared, essentially everything except deep delve and uber bosses. The character does about 2 million DPS, which, if you know anything about typical ice trap builds, is a small fraction of what's possible with a more offensive focus. But if you know me, then you know I tend to go all out on defensive layers before optimizing damage. Probably not the correct strategy at League's start, but I'm not too concerned with efficiency. The inspiration for this character was the new Spellblade support, which at level 21 adds 140% of local weapon damage to the linked spell. The unique dagger White Wind made a lot of sense for this, because it has high local cold damage. It also has a huge global cold damage modifier, 40% spell suppression, and some global evasion rating. White Wind is also dirt cheap, even at League's start, so I had a really comfy experience transitioning into maps. Beyond this, there's not a lot of interesting interactions on the offensive side. Because I'm a low-life spell build, I naturally take Pain Attunement for its multiplier to spell damage. Other than that, it's pretty much just your typical damage scaling. A mix of global damage, crit chance, crit multi, and trap throwing speed. I also have 18% chance for my traps to trigger twice, 20% chance to deal 50% more area damage, and 5% chance to deal double damage. I've got two curses, Frostbite and Assassin's Mark. Other debuffs include Cold Exposure, Unnerve, Shock, Bone Chill, and a Mastery that causes marked enemies to take increased damage. I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about defense than offense. This build has a lot of underutilized defensive layers, most notably the combo of Petrified Blood, Dissolution of the Flesh, and Eternal Youth. Historically, this combo has been used with Rage Vortex builds, utilizing Calm's Spirit combined with Strength of Blood, which has since been nerfed. I've got a different take on it here. If you're unfamiliar with how the interaction works, here's a summary. Petrified Blood is a skill that prevents you from recovering your life above 50% without using flasks to recover. This enables any mechanics that require you to be on low life, such as Pain Attunement, which this build uses. Petrified Blood also makes it so that when you take damage, some of the life loss is delayed and applied slowly over the next 4 seconds. I've got some other videos going into more detail about this skill if you want more info. Dissolution of the Flesh is a jewel that combos well with Petrified Blood. In addition to disabling all energy shield, Dissolution of the Flesh makes it so that any life loss from a hit causes you to reserve life instead of losing it. Ordinarily, this would be a bad thing, because life that is reserved cannot be recovered. In exchange for this apparent downside, Dissolution of the Flesh has a substantial multiplier to max life. The thing is, Dissolution of the Flesh allows you to negate the primary downside of Petrified Blood. Whenever you get hit, Petrified Blood delays 40% of the life loss, causing it to drain from the bottom half of your life bar. Thanks to Dissolution of the Flesh, the instant portion of life loss, instead of being subtracted from the bottom half of life, is instead reserved from the top half of life. If you don't take damage for two seconds, the life reservation is removed. The switch from life loss to life reservation means your entire life bar now benefits from Petrified Blood's effective HP multiplier. In my case, I have 6,000 life, which means that in order to one-shot me, an incoming hit needs to deal 10,000 damage so that my entire life bar gets reserved. So why Eternal Youth, then? Eternal Youth causes Energy Shield's recharge mechanic to apply to life instead. Here's why this works well with Petrified Blood and Dissolution of the Flesh. Life recharge stops when unreserved life is filled. Upon taking damage, you need to stop taking damage for two seconds before recharge begins again. Because Petrified Blood prevents recovery above 50%, as long as your unreserved max life remains above 50%, you'll never fill your unreserved life. Furthermore, since Dissolution of the Flesh prevents all life loss from hits, hits won't interrupt life recharge. Consequently, with these three combined, you can constantly be recharging life unless your life reservation exceeds 50% of max life, or you take damage over time, which does interrupt the life recharge. The default recharge rate is one-third of max life per second, so I'm constantly recovering 2,000 life per second. This quick recovery is great for two reasons. First, it helps to counteract the life loss over time from petrified blood. Second, it allows me to link my ice trap to life tap support and spend the life costs easily. I'm actually linking all my active skills to life tap, enabling me to forgo all mana investment and reserve my entire mana bar. It's worth noting that losing life by spending life costs doesn't count as taking damage, which means throwing my traps doesn't get in the way of Dissolution of the Flesh or Eternal Youth. Despite these synergies, Dissolution of the Flesh still leads to an annoying playstyle where you need to make sure you don't take damage for two seconds when you're in danger. I actually hated this initially. I had a lot of deaths after transitioning to Dissolution in situations that wouldn't otherwise have felt dangerous. 
I was considering pivoting off of Dissolution for a while, but I'm glad I stuck it out because after properly addressing its weaknesses, the build feels great to play. The best defensive layers to use with Dissolution of the Flesh are the ones that prevent all damage, such as Evasion, Dodge, and Block. This makes it a lot easier to go two seconds without taking damage. This character is heavily invested in Evasion. I can safely say that it's at the 95% Evade cap against virtually all content. Here we can see my character standing in the middle of a pack of monsters in a tier 16 map. Because of how Evasion's entropy system works, you can see here that I'm getting hit precisely once every 20 attacks. You can tell when I'm being hit because my ward goes down. Here's how I achieve this. I have about 40,000 Evasion reading, which on its own is certainly not enough to be anywhere near the Evade cap against anything. However, I also have a flat plus 8% chance to Evade from the Grace Watcher's Eye mod, and 10% more chance to Evade from Wind Dancer. Additionally, I blind all nearby enemies, blind anything I hit, and have a total of 125% increased blind effect. Similarly, I use Dread Banner with 50% increased aura effect to further debuff enemy accuracy. I made an evasion calculator spreadsheet a couple of years ago to better understand the reworks to evasion in patch 316. I've updated the sheet just now to make a point in this video. The graph on the right shows what my chance to evade is for various evasion ratings against the level 84 monster with no modifiers. At the bottom right it shows what evasion rating is required to hit the 95% evade cap which by default is about 185,000 evasion rating. That's not an achievable amount for any typical build, and this build is no exception. When I add in the Watcher's Eye mod, Wind Dancer, and both accuracy debuffs, now it only takes 10,000 evasion to hit the 95% evade cap. Even if we give the monster 150% increased accuracy, which is an amount that requires a rare confluence of events, it still only takes 29,000 evasion to hit the cap, which I'm able to do even while blinded myself. If there's anything you take away from all this, it's that you shouldn't sleep on accuracy reduction and direct modifiers to evade chance. I'll include a link to the sheet in the description in case you want to mess with it. On top of 95% evade chance, I have 75% chance to dodge spells through the acrobatics keystone. It's not easy to cap spell dodge in general, but White Wind makes that significantly easier. Unlike evasion, spell dodge doesn't use an entropy system to evenly space out incoming damage, so it's a bit less reliable as an enabler for dissolution of the flesh. Nonetheless, 75% spell dodge feels amazing, and is far better than 100% spell suppression for this build. As with any build relying on evasion or block, mitigation layers are important for surviving huge one-shot damage. As a generic layer of mitigation, I take 15% reduced damage from blinded enemies, which is an enormous amount of mitigation for a notable that already comes with all the blind stuff. I also take 20% less damage from attacks thanks to Wind Dancer. To deal with physical damage specifically, I have 29% of physical damage taken as elemental, which goes up to 44% when Taste of Hate is active. I also run Aspect of the Crab. Under normal circumstances, Aspect of the Crab is essentially never worth the 25% reservation it requires, but this build is able to get a lot of value out of it. I very rarely get hit with physical damage, so I'll always have a significant amount of physical damage reduction from the crab barriers. This physical damage reduction combos well with the physical damage taken as elemental, and the armor from my granite flask to make me feel invincible during regular mapping content. Furthermore, due mainly to the new tattoos from Ancestor League, I take 100% reduced extra damage from critical strikes, allowing me to safely stack crit for map mods and expedition remnants. As a late game optimization, I've managed to squeeze in a nice layer of ward on top of my 6000 life. I don't think I've ever seen anyone use ward as it was initially designed, but this build is an optimal use case for it. I take damage from hits infrequently enough that ward will almost certainly be up when I do. With two suffixes on gear, I'm able to get my ward restoration time down to under 2 seconds, which syncs up with the solution of the flesh's delay for removing life reservation. Finally, I have Steel Skin linked to cast when damage taken and increased duration. With increased duration, Steel Skin's duration is longer than 2 seconds, meaning it will be up long enough for both Ward and Dissolution of the Flesh to do their thing. Unfortunately, most of the aforementioned defensive layers do fuck all against damage over time. This build's Kryptonite. It didn't take too long to get the build to the point where the only thing that could kill me was damage over time, but man did damage over time suck to deal with. Dots are already really annoying on Petrified Blood builds in general, and although Dissolution of the Flesh helps you not die as quickly to them, it creates a new problem where you have to wait 2 seconds after you stop taking damage over time before life reservation wears off. One thing I did to combat this was to become immune to as many dots as possible. I'm immune to all ailments, including bleeding and poison, I'm immune to burning ground with the upgraded Abrath Pantheon power, and I'm immune to corrupted blood. Still, this leaves me vulnerable to dots such as ground degeneration like desecrated ground and duration-based effects like the essence drain from that one rogue exile. The thing that ultimately solved the dot problem was Lethe Shade, which causes me to take half damage from damage over time if I've just started taking damage over time. That may not sound like a game changer, but it can't be overstated just how much more comfortable the game felt after taking this keystone. 
I wasn't able to do so until I had full ailment immunity, but once I did, I really started to feel invincible. As an additional layer against dots, I used the Arakali Pantheon power, which grants 10% reduced damage over time taken and a bunch of chaos dot resistance. The passive tree is pretty unusual. I have six keystones allocated, Pain Attunement, Lethe Shade, Acrobatics, Wind Dancer, Iron Will, and Eternal Youth. I actually had seven keystones before I had enough spell suppression from gear to drop Mage Bane. I've already explained all of these choices, aside from Iron Will, which is just 39% increased spell damage for one skill point. My Ascendancy tree has Chain Reaction, Explosives Expert, Born in the Shadows, and Bomb Specialist, which I took in that order. There's not much else to say here, since none of the other options really do anything for the build. As for the rest of the tree, I'll just highlight some of the less common choices I made. The most noteworthy of these is the decision to grab the Blind Cluster next to Wind Dancer. For reasons I've already discussed, Blind Effect is a powerful way to scale evasion. In my opinion, saboteurs should always take Born in the Shadows, and builds with Born in the Shadows should always allocate this cluster. This mastery that prevents marked enemies from regenerating life is really useful for tanky rares and Maven-witnessed boss encounters. Given the relatively low DPS of my build, completing all the Maven invitations would have been a lot more annoying without this mastery. Since this build travels nearly all the way across the tree, it takes a lot of plus 10 attribute nodes that would be wasteful if not for tattoos. I use tattoos to get bleeding and poison immunity, dedicating 5 tattoos to each and taking the evasion mastery that grants 30% chance to avoid bleeding and poison. I use 9 tattoos that give 10% crit reduction each, getting the last 10% from my Timeless Jewel. Speaking of the Timeless Jewel, I use a Lethal Pride in this socket. This particular one comes with 4% max life, 5% double damage chance, 10% of physical damage taken as fire, and 10% crit reduction. These are all unnotables that I would have taken anyway. As for the other unique jewels, here I have an Ancestral Vision Jewel, which is especially efficient on an acrobatics build. Since I've invested into a 150% spell suppression chance, Ancestral Vision grants 75% ailment avoidance for a single jewel socket. My Watcher's Eye, in addition to the 8% flat evade chance I talked about earlier, also comes with 15% spell suppression chance. The last unique jewel is Dissolution of the Flesh. I use two clusters, one large and one medium. The large cluster has Blanketed Snow, which is an easy 10% cold penetration when combined with the Skitterbot's Chill. The medium cluster has Gorilla Tactics, easily the best cluster jewel notable for this build, with its 20% damage, 10% trap throwing speed, and 5% movement speed. I'd use two of these medium clusters if I could fit another one in, but I can't without making concessions I'd rather not make. My three rare jewels all have max life and trap throwing speed on them. I also use these to help overcap my resists and get curse resistance. Thanks to two jewels and one tattoo, I'm at 62% reduced curse effect, which makes curses from map mods pretty negligible. My equipment is mostly just decent rares. My only equipped uniques are White Wind and All's Uprising. All's Uprising was needed to make Grace have no reservation so that all the other reservations could fit in with no skill points invested in reservation efficiency. It's anointed with Whispers of Doom so that I can use both Frostbite and Assassin's Mark. My body armor has 3000 local evasion rating, 12% physical damage taken as elemental, 19% spell suppression, some resistance, 27% grace effect, and some crit multi. I really like the mastery that gives 15% max life if you don't have a life mod on your body armor, because then you don't feel bad about having prefixes like these. I actually think there's a better option for the body armor slot, which I'll go over in the final section of the video. My helmet and gloves are ward bases, crafted with dense fossils to have decent ward and faster ward restoration rate. The helmet has 7% physical damage taken as lightning, and 45% reservation efficiency for petrified blood. Technically, summon skitterbot's efficiency is slightly better for this build, but sometimes you have to take what you can get with the market for off-meta enchanted helmets. The boots are pretty standard spell suppression boots. It was a bit annoying to get the 25% ailment avoidance, given that it's one of the higher tier Eater of Worlds implicits. The enchantment grants 120% crit chance if I haven't crit recently. Since I'm a trap build, I never actually crit. It's my traps doing the crits, so the enchantment is just a permanent 120% increased crit chance. My belt is entirely unremarkable. This is actually the slot that's easiest to upgrade for a noticeable damage boost. Once again, I'll touch on that later in the video. The socketed abyss jewel has life, corrupted blood immunity, and fire damage to spells. It's important that this build have at least one source of flat fire damage to proc ignite and enable the 40% crit multi against burning enemies from explosives expert. My rings are similarly unremarkable, mostly used for filling out resists. One of my rings has aspect of the crab on it, but that can go on any empty suffix anywhere. Both rings have high tier life recoup, which is great on petrified blood builds for counteracting the life loss over time. My flasks are taste of hate and a granite flask for physical damage mitigation, a quartz flask for phasing, a diamond flask for DPS, and a quicksilver flask. 
This build doesn't benefit at all from having a life flask, despite being a life-based build, so it's fine to use all flask slots for utility. Next, let's talk about gems. My ice trap is linked to cluster traps, spell blade, life tap, awakened cold penetration, and trap and mine damage. Summon skitterbots and petrified blood are linked to a level 3 enlighten, and skitterbots apply bone chill to increase cold damage taken. I have my steel skin linked to cast when damage taken, increased duration, and life tap. I self-cast Anomalous Frostbite and Divergent Assassin's Mark. These are linked to Life Tap along with my Flame Dash gem. Grace is unlinked, and Dread Banner is linked to Generosity to boost its accuracy debuff. The build does have three fewer gem sockets than most builds, since it can't use its offhand slot. Incidentally, the loss of the offhand slot also means no shield charge, which is what I'd probably put in the extra three sockets if I had them. Because this build doesn't use any attacks, Mark on Hit isn't an option for automating the Assassin's Mark. It's possible to get around this on spell builds using the Commandment of Fury Glove Enchantment, which triggers a weapon attack on hit. However, since this is a trap build, it doesn't ever actually hit anything. It's possible to trigger the Glove Enchantment using a spell that hits, but at that point there's no advantage over simply casting Assassin's Mark myself. There's a lot I think could be done to optimize the character from here. I'm just at a point where I'd rather invest the money I have into my next build. This character has done everything I wanted to do, from League Start to the Feared, and I'm sitting on about 50 Divines, which is more than enough to get the next character going. Nonetheless, here's what I'd do if I did invest further. The easiest drop-in solution to making the build better is buying a Progenesis. It's certainly better than a Granite Flask, for preventing one-shots at least. Progenesis is just expensive, and it doesn't do anything against damage over time other than provide extra chaos resistance. Next, I'd get a better belt. Something like this would be a lot better than my current belt, and it would be very easy to make. Just buy a base with the crit enchant, use some speed catalysts, and spam essences of zeal until high tier life pops up with two open suffixes. Use orbs of annulment to try and free up the suffixes if necessary, craft aspect of the crab, craft hybrid attributes, and it's done. For more involved upgrades, the biggest one would be to just drop white wind and spellblade altogether, and use a more traditional caster weapon with extra gem levels and spell crit stuff. This would allow me to use the trigger benchcraft to automate my curses and open up the shield slot for shield charge and block chance. Yes, I'd lose 40% spell suppression, but there are other places to get that, including the shield slot itself and Magebane. Spellblade is a great support gem, but all things considered, I'm pretty certain that a really good rare weapon in Hypothermia would do more damage than White Wind and Spellblade. Perhaps it's better to think of White Wind as a good starting weapon, especially at League's start, but ultimately a stepping stone to a more traditional weapon. Objectively, I should have made this transition by now, but at that point I'm not playing a White Wind build, which was kind of the whole point from the beginning. The other big change that I could make is swapping my rare body armor out for a Kintsugi. It would synergize really well with the rest of my build, making me take 35% less damage if I haven't been hit recently. I'd lose quite a bit of spell suppression, but like I said, that can be found elsewhere. The 35% less damage taken works against damage over time, which I've already identified as this build's primary weakness. It wouldn't even be that hard for me to get one corrupted with additional gem levels, then use Tainted Currency to socket and link it. In hindsight, if I put more thought into this, I probably would have swapped to Kintsugi much earlier. Other than that, it's mostly just getting better versions of existing items. Better jewels, higher rolls on gear, alternate quality gems, higher tier Eldritch Implicits, etc. The little things that nonetheless add up to make a big difference in the end. I've learned a lot from making this character, some of which I'll definitely remember the next time I make a 95% evasion build. I've got a bunch of ideas for my next build, but I'm not sure which I'm going with. As always, the path of building link for this build is in the description. Let me know if there's anything you think I can do to improve upon this, or if you want some advice on how to use aspects of this build for yourself. Thanks for watching.